Next here. we're going to straight up copy. Oops, sorry about that. Excellent. Here we are. Doesn't appear that I'm streaming. One second. Okay, there I am. All right, sweet, great. I apologize if anyone's watching. I don't think so. All right. Okay. So let me share this to the relevant place, and then we will get to it. Um, Good morning, everyone. Hope we're all doing fine. Happy winter break for those who have it. Um, all right. So, what I want to do with this stream? Yeah, I hope everyone can hear me. Let me check my levels. I think this is good. Um, so, here's what we're gonna do. Um, I mentioned this in the announcements on the World Gig Discord. Basically, normally, in a normal game, in normal times, I would be able to play John Company with a lot of you all uh, at small conventions. And also, I'd be playing it a lot locally in person. But that hasn't really happened. Mostly, it's just been like Drew and I working on John Company for months and months and months. And, you know, I... So I'm a little hesitant to open it up to like public testing, get all that stuff going, because uh, I just, I want to take it through my digital approximation for like this phase of the project and here's my idea of how to do it so i'm going to teach you and so the, the the rules right now are going through editorial um travis is about like a third through them um over this next week they'll probably get there and then i'll share the, the google doc and we can do the comments and suggest changes and all that stuff but uh to try to like speed this along, I thought I would just like do my best to teach you and kind of introduce everybody to the, to the process. Um, so, uh, to that end, um, I posted a link. Let me uh, put that link on the screen here. Uh, where is that link? Here we go. So I posted a link to this uh, active kit folder, which contains two things. Uh, first, it contains the current set of the rules. Thank you, Dropbox. And then, uh, which you can find here, and then if you go up to the TTS save, it has the current JSON. Now, if you've never done uh, prototyping in TTS, basically this JSON right here and the thumbnail is optional, but the thumbnail, you can uh, drop this into your TTS uh, by going to um, this folder. Now, I have a PC, so this is going to be different for Mac users, but basically users, your name, documents, my games, tabletop simulator, you go to your saves and you just dump it right in here. Now, uh, this is, I'm going to go slightly technical here. Uh, a TTS mod is a JSON file, which just has a bunch of like positions and attributes to every object in the game. Here it is. And uh, those things reference um, certain things on the on, on the cloud, uh, basically all the files in a TTS. The reason why I prefer TTS to Vassal is this mod, the John Company mod is 600 kilobytes. Uh, all of the digital assets are on my Dropbox. And so if I change a digital asset, everyone's mod will be correct so long as they turn off caching in Tabletop Simulator. So then we go off, uh, open up ta Tabletop Simulator right here. Uh, and do, 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 we're going to go ahead and create a game. I'll just do a single player. And here on the save and load, you'll see uh, John Company sitting right here. Okay. So um, this will take a little bit to load. And um, you don't have to keep your mod caching off. But if you want the latest files, just like turn it off, load the mod, and you can turn it back on again. Um, so yeah, here here's the mod in all of its all of its glory. Um, I'm gonna be filling uh, like I have a lot of stuff to say, kind of pre-teach. 
Um, so apologies for that, I guess. Um, so uh, thing one that I'm going to say is that uh, this mod is not a great TTS mod. It's a TTS mod that I built, um, and I will eventually be getting um, Agent Elrond, the person who built the Pax Premier mod, to build a proper John Company mod. But this is what I've got, and it, and it works just fine for the purposes of play. Um, so uh, basically everything works here, uh, and you have access to the full game. Uh, which is to say all the scenarios, everything. Um, sort of. So the rules are complete for all those things, but there are a few small elements that are missing. Um, so for instance, uh, the law that creates the Governor General, which people will know about if they've played the first edition, uh, I'm taking that out of the deck for now. Um, it's a important and disruptive law, and I think I have a working version of it here, but some of the assets just aren't quite right. Uh, so they're sitting here. The superintendent of trade in China works just fine. So it's it's just sitting over here. Um, and then uh, there, I have scenario cards for all the different scenarios right now. They're not quite done though, and I want to fix some layout stuff. So they'll, they'll probably come out later this week. So I just have the game set up uh, at, is the um, 1710 early company scenario. Now, uh, just so what I'd like to do here, so I'm happy to take any questions people have about the about learning the game in chat. I'm really going to try to like teach it straight, um, and I, I've been practicing, so I, I should do okay at this. Uh, and but before we do that, will uh, the board still fit in? A, see, will uh, Ed Wilford is asking the really important questions. Yes, uh, the box may be deeper, but it will be the, the same height and width. Um, so I, I'm not. I'm not sure yet. Right, like Drew and I actually just finished the RFQ. I'll be sending it to the factory today, probably. Um, and I, uh, I'm pretty pumped. But we also are gonna like. Uh, there are a lot of things about the, how this game is going to look that remain to be seen, depending on how expensive it is. Um, we, uh, you're uh, Namu. You're looking at John Company here. This is the new version of John Company. Um, Oh, and I'm talking about the Pax Premier re re reprint. The box should be able to fit in the Pax Premier reprint. Uh, the same size size box. Uh, but I think there will be more stuff. Like There's a world where this game is the same price. It could be a little bit more expensive. We could... I don't know. That's a whole... I could talk all day about what we're going to do about the product side of this. Uh, okay. I'm teaching the game. That's my goal here. So, uh, first, let's do a general tour on uh, components. So every family has uh, 22 family members. They have different illustrations on them, um, but uh, they are all the same. 22 family members. And then they also have this little disc here that's used for victory points. Uh, every family also has a player board. Uh, the reverse side of the player board is the uh, private firm board. We'll talk about those um, in another stream, probably. I'm not going to be teaching the private firm game in this stream. And then I have a little counter uh, that I use for the treasury. The actual game will have some kind of punch board coin. Um, and th all of the sizes on the game are large enough so that people can use their poker chips if they want. Um, okay, so that's the pieces of, of a family has. Now, um, if you run out of family members, you can pick them up from prizes that you've scored. Uh, it, it, it shouldn't happen, and the component limits on the family is something that I'm looking at right now. Uh, it's, a, it's, it's, up, it's in the de current development cycle. So that, that's what each player has. Um, you'll note that players do not, by default, start with any cash. I'll talk about that later. Uh, we have a deck of prestige cards here. Here's a prestige card. Prestige cards have a prestige value in the top left. They have a time window when they are effective, uh, and then they have uh, an effect right here. Um, most prestige cards, even like this one, could be um, played face up whenever you'd like, uh, and then it has a window that when it can actually be used and it will instruct you how the, how they work. Well, let's look at another one. Oh, that's the same card. Um, so stockbroker, for instance, uh, this is a two-value prestige card. It's class is a negotiation power. Uh, these are like keywords. They do different things. Uh, and then uh, during the family phase, you may sell anyone's shares with consent for four each from the bank. So four each from the, from, from the, the share. So I could say, hey, I'll sell your share. You can have two, and I'll take two. We'll split the price. That's how the, this card works. So these are prestige cards. Um, oops. 
and put them back properly. Here we are. Um, these are debt fatigue and chaos uh, discs. These are used for all kinds of things uh, in the game. And they're in this infinite bag. Uh, there will be like 40 of these in the game. You'll, you'll never run out. Uh, and they're, they are not component limited anyway. Uh, these three things are the deeds. Uh, you can have a deed to a factory, you can have a deed to a manor, and you can have a deed to a shipyard. Um, f uh, important notes, the, the cost is in the top left, so shipyards cost three for a deed, manors cost five, factories cost two plus X. And X is the value of the current factory profitability, which at the start of the game is one. So uh, factories at the beginning of the game cost three bucks, and they make a buck a turn. Uh, shipyards and factories also have the ability to cast votes. They have a vote cast side on the back. Manners do not. All right, those are the deeds. Uh, other pieces that matter. So over here uh, on India, you'll note that every region has a little fort. And on the top of it is a dome. A dome means uh, that it is not ruled by the British if there's a dome on it. And then every fort level is uh, a strength point. Um, so we've got like Maratha here has a strength of two. The Punjab has a strength of, of one. Or a strength of zero, sorry, strength of zero. Um, these are presidency dividers. We'll talk about them later. Uh, they very rarely are used in games, but we have to have a few of them. Um, over here we have uh, loot dice. Uh, the sides are 2, 2, 3, 3, 4, and skull. This is how much money you'll get when you go off looting. Uh, the money is divided by the victorious army. Uh, this is the weather die. It's used to see which ships are damaged. It has a side for each of the three sea zones and then one side that is all three sea zones and two sides that are blank. Uh, over here we have the Envoy to China. You used to track the opening of China with this. Uh, we have um, Ganjifa event tiles. These will probably be punch board after much review. Um, there's only 20 of them. There'll probably be one mil punch board. Um, and then we have uh, the, uh, event, the event deck here. This is a little vote track to help you vote. Uh, and that is a pretty big overview of the components. We'll talk about the board in a second. Let's look at some of the other components first, though. So uh, every office in the game has an office card associated with it. And on that office card are uh, the instructions of what that office does so that you can actually just, like, read the card. You don't have to worry about decoding any weird icons or anything like that. Uh, so, you know, the director of trade has the power to transfer, etc. Um, some office cards have these little tables. Um, if you've played John Company before, you know there's a check system where you like purchase a quantity of dice and then you lose some dice and then you roll the remainder. Uh, that is captured here with the white die and red die. So, you know, at the bottom trade starting in Bengal, the bottom part of this card, um, the white dice cost a buck each. And um, the red dice for other regions, you pay for red. And we'll, we'll talk about that more when we actually get to it. Um, okay, so then we've got all these pink cards. Uh, and these are the setup cards. Setup is handled very differently in this game than from the, the first game. Uh, and, and I will talk more about setup when we get to it in just a minute. Uh, before we get to setup, I want to uh, talk about the board. So here's the current board of the game. And it is, um, you know, people who've been watching my occasional streams will see some little changes here and there. Um, but, oh, oh, I should say, my internet will probably go out randomly, but I'll be back, don't worry. So just just, just be prepared if I stop talking. Um, so uh, the way that this board works is, uh, y basically, John Company is a very procedural game. We have all of these phases. So you're going to start here, and we'll go these phases, and then we'll go through these phases at the bottom, and then we'll go through these phases. And then the game is over. And we advance the turn track, bloop, and then we go back over here, and we start the whole thing over again. Um, so it's like weird because it's like top to bottom, left to right, bottom to top. So um, on the board we have a number of player aids. Uh, this explains the in game, which I'll talk about. Um, 
this is the ter game turn. The game is five turns long by default. The long scenario is eight. Uh, in our playtest, we've been getting it done in about two hours. Uh, we're pretty speedy and we're, we talk fast. So I would, I was, I guess that for your first game, it's going to be like three, three and a half. It should probably come down close to two. The, the full game is now going to probably be about three or four hours, depending on group temperament. So uh, uh, generally a little faster than First John Company. And if you have a group that likes to talk, nothing in this game will stop you from talking, and so the game could be quite long. But you might, you know, uh, that is to the player's taste. Uh, okay, so we have a company standing track. Uh, this is how you see if the company is going to fail. So if this marker shows the company standing... And if it ever creeps down here to the bottom of this track, to this F, the company is, is done and failed. On the other hand, if uh, the company gets debt, and debt fills this track, and it ever has to take debt right here, then the company will also fail. So that the company can die from fail, failure of standing or from being flooded by debt. Both of those are ways it fails. Uh, this box holds the quarter directors. These are family members who are shares in the company. Uh, this box holds the vacant offices. Now, you'll notice there's no hiring ribbon anywhere on this board for those who play the first edition. What happens is when a, when a position uh, attrishes, you flip it over and put it here in the vacant offices. And then when you do the vacant offices, you arrange them by number, so the low number on top. And then you just follow the instructions on the card. You know, so the president of Bengal, chosen by the director of trade, the candidate pool is anyone in the presidency. And then after that's done, we go to the next office. Uh, on the splay, you'll notice that we've added from the last version you guys saw, uh, who chooses has been added to the splay. Um, cool. So that is that. That's the vacant offices track. Uh, many offices have treasuries, as you can see right here. Uh, these boxes are army boxes. One thing about the army boxes is that if an army piece is up here, an officer is uh, unexhausted, and then if they move down here, they become exhausted. And then at the end of the turn, they'll they'll fix themselves right up. Now, these pieces are pretty large, and I, I want them kind of big because I really like these, these portraits. Um, but this does necessitate that players stack pieces if they have like a ton of armies in a box. Uh, and, and if, in fact, these spots have not enough real estate, I'll make these boxes bigger. That's not the end of the world. Um, okay, so what else do I need to say about India? So I, I uh, or what I should say about the game. Um, on the board, you see this big map of India. Now, there's a few elements to this map that I just want to highlight. So one, you'll know, and I'll kind of go to a three-quarters view here. Let's say we're playing XCOM. Um, every region has a dome. And what the dome means is that the region has not been uh, conquered by the company. Uh, some regions have a flag. Now, in the actual game, these flags will be, like, stuck in the dome, little metal flags. Um, but I, I don't know how to do that in TTS, so don't, don't mind me. Um, what, what will happen here is that we have these flags. If the flag is on the dome, the region is said to be sovereign. If the flag is on a region it is a dominion of that region. So here we have Delhi, which has two dominions, the Punjab, a little sword, and then Maratha, a little rat. And so uh, these regions don't have their own flag, and we can imagine this is, as the, the remnant of the Mughal Empire, or the, the, the current state of it. Uh, so then uh, we have the elephant. So the elephant's still in the game, uh, and the elephant is placed on a border, and it marks... Um, the current crisis, the looming crisis. So the, here the looming crisis is Maratha attacking Delhi. Because Maratha is a dependent of Delhi, um, this attack is um, this attack is classed as a rebellion. We'll talk about that later. Uh, but for you know, for instance, Hyderabad could attack Bombay. You put the elephant on this border in that case. Um, now you'll note that there are these little circles and moons and stuff. Uh, this is new. It basically just uh, moderates how the elephant moves, and we'll talk more about that uh, when it comes to the event phase. So there, there's no ambiguity in the elephant movement anymore. Uh, uh, lastly, but probably most importantly, uh, we have orders. 
So all of the, this game doesn't have any of the order card, the the region cards that were in the first version of John Company. Instead, uh, we have the orders are directly on the map, and if an order is filled. Um, it gives the company the amount of revenue listed on the order, and you track that revenue by moving up this income track right here. Um, some orders have chaos on them, these little black pieces, which I should label chaos as well. Um, chaos blocks uh, the order from being filled. So these are like walls. So like here's a kind of a trade region that's been set up. Madras is a small trade region. Bombay is a little bit bigger. You get the idea, uh, hopefully. So, okay, that is a tour through the general components. And again, I don't know if this is the proper way of teaching the game. It's just I think this is what seems to me to be a reasonable way to do it uh, on stream. And, and again, I, if, if anyone has any specific rules questions um, as I start to get into the weeds, please let me know, and I'll see if I can answer them. Um, okay, let's get into the game. So, um, we have setup. Setup works quite differently from regular John Company. The first thing that you do is you're going to take the 12 core setup cards right here, and you're going to give them a shuffle. I should give these a back right now. They're just their back is the same as their front. Anyway, give them a shuffle. Um, then you refer to this chart, and so we're playing the 1710 scenario. Let's imagine we have. Um, I don't know, four players. So what we're going to do is we're going to add four cards. So four players, four cards. That Boy, that arrow is very helpful. <laughs> um, anyway, you hopefully see what I mean here. So 1710, we're going to add four extra setup cards to the deck. So we go here to the, to the deck. We've got this stack down here of the extra setup cards. We're going to take one, two, three, four. Okay. Now these setup cards go here, and now we have 16 cards in the pile, and every player gets four, and you just deal them randomly. And this is the player's start position. There you go. So we'll, you know, I'm not going to set up the entire game right now, but um, I'm just going to sort of show you what a setup position looks like. So here are the, are, are the, the, the four startup cards. Now remember, this deck, I'll say that again, is divided evenly among player counts. So... Uh, if there are four players, there were 16 cards, everybody gets four cards. All right, so let's take a look at how this works. So we just go through these cards one by one. So it's card one, no, the treasury gets zero dollars, my personal family treasury. And then I get president of Bombay and a share. The share I just put on the court of directors. The president of Bombay, I put my guy right here, president of Bombay. And then I take my zero dollars and then I just kind of put this one to the left. Now, some of these have a little, like, 1813 with a strike through it. What this means is that in the 1813 scenario, you don't use that card. And I'll just show you up here, if you play the other scenarios, it has the date of the scenario on the card. Uh, you, you can probably figure that out. Yeah, this <laughs> Ryan sees my, my start money. is Well, it's not horrible because of this card. It's kind of saved me. So then... Um, because I put my piece on the President of Bombay, I also will come over here and grab my President of Bombay card and just put it in front of me in my play area. Uh, then we go to Director of Trade and a share. So I get my, another share here. And then I get a piece in the Director of Trade right there. And I take the Director of Trade right here. Boop. Whoops, not the, that's not the Director of Trade. Okay, uh, no money was associated with that. And then I go to this one. That's $3. Thank goodness I get some money. And then a writer in Bombay and an officer in Bombay. So we go here, and we'll put this guy up here. That's this one. And then I get a, a dollar, a share, and a writer in each. So we'll do a writer in each. This is what I mean about stacking the pieces. Uh, and then a share. There we go. Look at my shares. All right. And then these can be just deleted or thrown to the side or whatever. Okay, so that's how you do setup. Now, for players who really want to be sharks, um, you can totally draft setup cards. Um, that's fine. Like you can you can do like a you can do multiple rounds of drafting or whatever drafting system you like best is fun, is good. Um, okay, so that that's how setup works. Now we're going to imagine that I do the setup for everybody else, right? So I'm I'm just going to put some pieces out here for sake of example. Um, 
Obviously, none of the colors are final. Um, there we go. We got lots of lots of good stuff going on here. Okay. So again, I'm just setting this up for example. Just trying to get some pieces on the board. Um, all right. We'll do it like that. Okay, cool. So now we're now we're in a pretty good spot. We have a, a kind of setup board. Um, all right, and then oh, another thing. We'll do it like this. So uh, if ever you uh, get a setup card with a shipyard on it, let me find. An example to show you. So uh, the because I think that's the only thing I didn't explain. Um, so some setup cards have shipyards on them. So this says a shipyard unfitted. What that means is I would take like the Atlas, and then I would take the matching ship. These are both in the same order. So if you pull evenly, they'll, you'll be fine. Um, so an unfitted ship means that the ship is sitting on the shipyard. It hasn't been fitted yet. The graphic design on these is obviously not great, but uh, I'll, I'll clean that up later. So um, this is an unfitted ship. This ship is two shipyards, and one ship goes in the South Indian and one in the East Indian. So uh, what will happen is all these ships will be out um, for in the starting. So there are always three ships starting the game. Um, okay, so now we're done talking about setup. I think that's the only other weird thing about setup that happens. So we'll just delete all that. Uh, okay, you know what? We're going to delete these setup cards, too. We, we don't need them. We'll, we will clear things as we go. All right. So everyone is ready. Everyone's ready to go. Uh, now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to teach this game. Uh, so John Company is kind of a funny teach. Um, the game is... It's got, there's a lot there. A lot of meat on the bone. Um, but the game actually like just wants you to play it. And usually while you play it, it will kind of like reveal itself um, because it, it, it chunks all of the things that you need to know how to play the game as you're playing it, right? So um, for instance, then, uh, what I'm going to do with, with this teach basically is I'm going to run through all of the core rules that are relevant to the first turn. So for instance, the game begins with attrition and family upkeep, but this is skipped on the first turn. So we're not going to talk about it right away. Uh, and then I will go through everything here, and then I will explain uh, some little bits about the end of the game. But then I'll skip and I'll talk about attrition and stock buys and hiring, and then I'll talk about the events last. So it's going to be like a little bit of a, um, I don't know, it's an experiment. But I think I think this will probably be the way for you guys to internalize uh, the best from a video. Who knows? Uh, all right, so here we have a game kind of set up. Uh, this is not quite right, but it's 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 pretty close. Um, and so we're going to go ahead and start the game, and I'll kind of walk through it. So uh, you skip this phase on the first turn, so we move to the family phase. Now, the way the family phase works is some poor sap is the chairman of the company. Here's the chairman. And they're going to get this big chairman marker, which shows that they start. Like they're usually going to like they're going to be the initiator of things, so uh, they get to go first and they get to take their family phase. Now at the start of the family phase, everybody should take children, depending on what turn it is. So you always get your first child. Oops. You always get your first child. So you always every turn you get a first child. If you're playing with two players, you always get a second child. If you're playing with three or four players, you get a child on the even turns. If you're playing with five or six players, you never get a second child. So here's my little child. And this is the first turn of the game. We're imagining this is a four-player game, so I do not get a second child. Now, during my family phase, I take any number of family actions. And these family actions basically just mean turning this child into different things. Uh, so, you know, commonly you're going to only get one. You know, you're only going to do one thing during your family action phase. Um, oh, ooh, before I get into this, quick break, quick break. Um, John Company's negotiation game. Almost everything in this game is tradable. 
You can trade money. You can trade deeds. Um, you cannot trade office holders or people employed by the company. So, like, I can't give you this Bombay presidency. However, because um, a someone in the core of directors really just represents paper, they're just a bunch of shares, I can say, like, say, hey, uh, Yellow, I would love to buy your share for six. And Yellow says, okay, and they take their piece back, and then I put my piece in their place. That is a legal trade. So, this game's a negotiation game. You can trade all kinds of things. You can also, if you don't want to trade stuff you own, you can trade uh, tokens from your stock. These are called promises, and you just give them to other players. Like that. Um, and uh, the way promises work, I guess I should go ahead and ex finish explaining this. So, um, you can trade. Now, white could say, uh, hey, I really want something from blue. But I don't want to give you any of my pieces. What, what would you take leverage over green? And blue could say, yeah. And so you, you can trade other people's uh, promises too. Now, um, at the end of the game, uh, players must buy back all their promises for two bucks a pop. And any that they can't buy back, they lose two victory points per promise. It's pretty rough. So just know you got that coming. Uh, the one rub on this is that uh, the player with the most prestige card gets to collect all their. Uh, the most prestige value, the highest value of all their cards collect, uh, together, gets to collect all of their, their promises back up. Um, we'll talk about that when we get to the end scoring. Um, and uh, Ryan, uh, when you buy back your promises, the money goes to the player that you bought it from. So in this instance, like if green had $4 in the end game, right, they would give those $4 to white and take their promises back, uh, which, which is very important for how the end game scoring works. Um, yeah, promises are promises are really good, really important in the game. Um, now, in the original game, there were all these conditions for getting your promises back; those are gone. Um, and there is one there is one place in the rules where you're forced to give promises, which we'll talk about when we get to hiring. Um, okay, so family phase: you're you've got a child, and you, that child has got to become something. Uh, so, how does that work? Uh, basically, here are the options: you could enlist your child. And with, when that happens, you make them a writer in one of the three presidencies, or you send them to become an officer in training. These are both free. So here's an officer in training. Here is becoming a writer. Um, in general, uh, becoming an officer is a selfish thing. You are trying to position yourself to loot. It's going to hurt the company. Uh, being a writer is a good thing for the company. So you can do both. You can hurt the company or help the company for free. Um, okay, that's in list. Seek share. So to seek a share, the way this works is you have to pay the value on these circles, and then you move your piece to that spot in the stock exchange. I'll talk about how the stock exchange works later, but know that you can just you can move it to any spot. I could spend five dollars, I could spend three dollar or three dollars or two dollars or whatever. I can't put my piece where another piece is. It has to be an empty spot. That's seek share. Uh, and that money is paid out of, out the game. Uh, purchase a deed. So there are three deeds you can buy. Uh, they cost three, five, or two plus profits. And when you buy the deed, you just put it in your player area. If you bought a shipyard, you get the matching ship. So I could you know buy the ship yard, and then there's the diligence sitting. Oops, on that on that card. There we go. Um, All right, so now that is purchase deed. Uh, and then the last thing you can do is you can re retire if you have a pensioner. So I haven't talked about pensioners yet. You get them when your guys re retire, uh, or when, yeah, when your guys fail their attrition rolls. And when, if you have a pensioner, you can assign them to one of these fabulous prizes by spending the money. Now I'll just review the prizes very quickly. Uh, the cost of the prize is in the top left. The victory point value is in the bottom right that it's worth. And you can adjust your victory point marker um, for that. There, are, there, There's no accrual of, it, like, I don't know the right word for it. All the victory points in this game are transparent and can be tracked at any time. So players, you know, if this track ever gets out of date, you can just adjust it. It's not hard. Um, so, uh, you know, prize, uh, the, the cost for the prize is here. The... Uh, victory point value is in this kind of silvery hexagon. Uh, in the top right are the expenses that living there is going to cost your family for the rest of the dang game. 
And in the bottom left is the number of prestige cards that are drawn. So if you score this house, you get to draw a prestige card from the deck. And the, these go into your hand by default. Uh, prestige cards also uh, can negotiate. You can trade them from hand to hand. You can trade them from your play area to someone else's play area. Uh, unless it says can't transfer or something like that. Um, okay, so that's the family phase. That's it. Uh, just goes around once. You do all your family actions in one go. So if, if I had like a bunch of children and pensioners, I would do all of these things. And then I'm done. So, like, previously, you, you just took, like, one, in the first edition of the game, you just took one at a time. That doesn't happen anymore. Now you can do, you can go several rounds. All right, that's the family action. Uh, we're skipping private firms. We're, uh, we're going to skip stock buys for now. I'll talk about them later. And then we, we're going to skip hiring for now because there's no one to hire. So now, this little piece enters, whoops, enters the... Um, I should turn off my UI one second. Is it F11? Yep. I don't think I need it. So now this enters the company's operation, which is this like bottom row. Uh, and the first thing that operates is the, the chairman. Now, uh, the chairman is very different from the first edition. And I, I, I'm trying not, for people who have, haven't played the first edition, I'm not going to harp too much. I imagine I'm going to write a lot about the differences in this game. Um, Maybe I'll just do a separate video for, like, John Company for people who already know it. But uh, a lot, a lot has changed. Um, so the chairman is much more powerful. Um, now, the chairman has three actions they have to do. And whenever a uh, role has several actions, they always have to be done in that order. So the first thing the chairman can do is ha they have to seek debt. Or they have the option of seeking debt. Take debt with the consent of a majority of shares in the court of directors. That's the first thing they do. They seek debt. Then they get to allocate funds, and then they get to do a special envoy. So the way seeking debt works is uh, currently this company has a credit line of eight. There, there are eight empty spots in this track, right? All these spots are empty. So the chairman could ask for eight debt if they wanted. And uh, the they ha in order to make that request, they have to have... Uh, a pure majority, over half of the shares in the core directors have to agree with their request. Which means they would need like blue and one other player to agree to take out that much debt. And so, you know, after some haggling, now this, like, there isn't a very strict um, phase limit here. Like, so for example, uh, the chairman could say, like, I really want three debt. And then blue could say, hell no. The chairman would say, well, what about two debt? Eh, two is fine. Maybe one, should you, let's just do one. And so this is a conversation between the court. It, all they need is verbal cons consent, right? So like, you know, if it were, for instance, if the shares looked like this, let's just say the shares look like this, for instance. Um, let's say Blue says, I'm only going to give you one debt, but then the other three players are like, no, 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 we'll do three debt or two debt or whatever. So the they arrive at that number, and then the chairman takes out the required number of debt, which goes on the company standing track. And then for every debt token they took, they get five bucks. So if they took two debt, they're going to get five, ten dollars. Now they started with, with five in uh, income, so now they have 15. And after they've taken their debt, they get to allocate funds. Now they can allocate funds among any of these three treasuries, and they can hold up to five uh, in, in the coffers for the special envoy, which I'll talk about in a second. So allocation of funds is very simple. They, you know, subtract some money here. Let's say they just took $3 there. They could go one, two, three, or whatever. Um, and so that they can spend down their money, etc. And then any money that's left, so up to $5 can remain. And after they've finished allocating uh, their funds, they may hold up to five for one special envoy. So, the special envoy. Uh, now, this introduces you to the, one of the most important concepts in John Company, the check. So, in John Company, uh, you often can, will be buying a number of dice. Let's say, um, let's see here. So, they have $4 left, and they have to spend all of it on the special envoy. I'll just say that again. The chairman can keep up to $5 after they allocate. They must spend every penny of the money remaining on the special envoy. So, they spend four, let's say, and that buys four red dice. Now, the special envoy doesn't have a penalty, which is why it says none here in, in, in this box. Now, 
the, there are uh, they have different targets with their special envoy. So they can declare that they want to remove a chaos from India. This is like a trade mission. They can advance the, the China mission, should say the China envoy. Or they can peek at the top two cards of either of these decks. So uh, the way it works is you roll, like let's say I'm going to say, I would like to eliminate this chaos in Madras. I'm going to send a trade envoy. They roll the dice, and you only refer to the lowest number. If it's a one or a two, it's successful, and you do whatever the action was. In this case, removing the chaos. If it were a three to four, nothing happens. If it were a five to six, it's a catastrophic, scandalous failure, and this piece immediately is returned to stock. So if you roll one die, you're being very risky. Right, there's a chance you're going to succeed. There's also a chance that you're going to lose the chairman, which is a huge loss. Um, okay, so that's uh, the, the special envoys. Now, the way the envoy to China works is if you're successful, you advance the track one. If you're successful again on a future turn, you advance the track a second time and create a special office, which you just put on the board like that. And then um, there is a... Where is he? There he is. Here's the, the superintendent. Whenever you create an office, you take the piece. Here's the superintendent of trade to China. And he goes flipped into the vacant offices and will get filled next turn. So this a newly created office doesn't act the turn it's created. It acts the next turn. Uh, okay, but we're not going to China. Pro tip for the early company scenario, probably don't want to go to China. You'll, you, you will r probably ruin, wreck the company. Um, okay, so let's get to the other offices. So th the chairman office is really probably like one of the most complicated in the game. Uh, if you get to Special Envoy without money... Oh, uh, you don't have to... Uh, great question um, f f from the chat. Uh, the, the chat asks, if you don't have any money for Special Envoy, do you auto-fail? No, you, you don't have to do a Special Envoy. Just if you have money, you do. So if you want, like, if you have one dollar left, you've got to spend on a special envoy. If you have zero dollars left, you you never attempted it. Um, you should never attempt it with one. I mean, unless, well, no, nah, you should never do it with one. It's funny I say that, but in a recent game I did it with two, and it was total. It was it was worth it. Um, okay, so let's continue on then uh, to shipping. Shipping, if the chairman is one of the hardest offices in the game, the shipping is probably the easiest. Uh, the way shipping works is uh, you have the power to fit ships. If there are player-owned shipyards with ships, you must spend $3 for each to the bank, if able. Then place the ship in a presidency of your choice. Um, so the way this works is shipping has... Uh, so like right now, let's use this as an example. So let's say the Hastings family over here owns the Diligence. There's the Diligence. Whoops, uh, and the shi the shipping office is five dollars. They need to fit new ships. There is a player-owned ship, so they can spend three dollars. One, two, three. They must spend three dollars to buy this ship, and then the shipping office gets to put it in any of the three sea zones. Whoops. Ah. So the shipping office can put it wherever. And you should turn off the snap points on these ships. I thought I already did, but maybe I'm wrong. Um, so the shipping office gets to decide which, which shipyard, which sea zone it goes to. Um, now, if there are no player-owned ships, the, um, shipping office, if they have $6, they can buy the company its own shipyard and fit a ship immediately to put it out there. So the company itself can buy, um, can buy, uh, ships and stuff. Uh, do you encourage secret trades? Text information from peak cards for X. Oh, totally. Oh my gosh. So in it, I'll just say one thing about negotiation in this game. You can go buck wild. Um, I've seen players like loan cards to each other and charge interest for those loans, depending on the term. Um, you can you can do all sorts of wild things. Um, people like, well, I don't know. There, there are all kinds of weird virtual negotiation economies in the game. And you, you can be as uh, clever as you'd like. Um, okay, so that's uh, the shipping office. The thing, um, the shipping office ab ability to purchase company ships is a little funny, and it's something I'm I'm working out right now. It's an important option though because it allows 
a chairman to direct a lot of money. Like basically, the company historically leased most of its ships, which is why we have a leasing system in this game. Uh, but it could have changed its policy and owned more of its own fleet. And so I want to make sure that's a that's a thing that can happen. Uh, okay, that's the shipping office. Director of trade. Director of trade, very powerful office, very simple office. So here's the director of trade. By the way, um, the player making these actions is the player who controls the office, just in case I wasn't super clear about that. Uh, okay, so the director of trade. Uh, the director of trade over here, here he is, the director of trade, has one power, the power to transfer, and they, make, they can make up to two transfers. Each transfer moves one rider from one pre or ship from one presidency to another. So the director of trade can say, I'm going to transfer a ship here, and I'm going to transfer a ship here. Now, you might say, oh no, the Bengal and Bombay presidency just got really screwed. Yes, they did. And so the director of trade is an immensely powerful position because they can move the fleet around. They can also move the riders around. So they get two transfers. The transfer could be a boat from one to one or a rider from one to one. Or, you know, you could do like a boat and a rider. Um, the riders are important because riders and boats, uh, the lower of the two establishes the trade bandwidth, which we'll talk about soon. Um, also, the riders in a region are the promotion pool. So, like, if, if this blue rider in Madras was transferred to Bombay and Madras has to be filled, now blue isn't eligible to fill it anymore. So, director of trade, very powerful. Uh, lots of coercion happens around his office. Um... Okay, so now we get to military affairs. Uh, military affairs is over here. This guy with uh, a fabulous mustache. Just I'll spotlight his mustache for a second. Um, I was talking to one of the playtesters uh, recently about how one thing I love about this painting is every time I look at him, I imagine his facial hair is different. It like it morphs. Um, okay, so uh, what do, what's military affairs do? First thing they do, they have an officer transfer. They may make up to two officer transfers. Each transfer moves one officer from one army to another army. So I could, like, transfer like this. That's a very reasonable officer transfer. Or I could, like, transfer like this, right? It's just two movements of officer pieces. Then any officers in training go out, and I get to choose which army they go to. All officers transferred uh, go to the ready side. They don't. They don't stay here. Okay, that's military affairs. Easy. Then we get to the presidencies. All right, let's talk about the presidencies. So, see a chairman. I'm gonna put you over here, just like so clear my clear my area. Uh, now, the presidencies are about as complicated as the chairman. They're like where some of the the, the trickiness of the game is. Um, but well, the nice thing is that all three presidencies behave basically the same way. So once you have a good handle on one presidency, you're good. So uh, presidencies basically have two different types of actions. They have military actions, and then they have a trade action. Uh, all of their military actions have to be done before they do their trade action. So the president of Bombay has invade Bombay or quell chaos, and then they have trade starting in Bombay. Um, so let's talk about the military actions first. So you'll, the cost for the for a die in the military action is that sword, it's meant to be officer. So like every officer you exhaust is a die and every two dollars you spend or two pounds you spend is a die. So you know the Bombay presidency for example uh, could spend two and then spend another two, so four total to buy two dice. Uh, this represents hiring local mercenaries. And then they could exhaust this officer to buy a third die. So now they're rocking in the world with three dice. Now, what can they do with that army? Well, they've got two options. They can quell chaos, and that just means destroying one of these chaos tokens. To quell chaos, they have to pay the penalty of the fort. Height in the region. So Bombay. So okay. So chaos is kind of a funny name because this also represents just anti-trade, uh, anti-globalist attitudes. And so if Bombay is a strong regime, you have to pay more to try to break those attitudes up. Uh, so this is a penalty of one because this fort is one level high, as you can see. 
Uh, so we're going to try to quell this chaos. So we lose one die because of the height of the fort. We're now rolling just two dice. And one of them's a one. It's successful. Hooray. Now, when this happens, first thing you do is you roll a single loot die. And this much money is given to, is split as evenly as possible by the army. Any remainder of this money is lost. So this would be $4 goes to yellow to quell this chaos. And then that chaos goes. And it's gone. Now, one of these results, I don't know which dice face it is, there it is, is a skull. When a skull is rolled, everybody with an officer has to roll a die, and on a five or six, their officer dies. And this death happens critically before um, the loot is split, which can mean that you lose your loot share. I've seen people create insurance policies for the game, so that even if their officers die, they still have some, some claim. Um... Okay, so that's one thing you can do. You can quell chaos. The second thing you can do is you can attempt to take over the region. And there are reasons why you want to do this and reasons why you don't want to do this. Um, so, reasons why you want to do it. Um, in Bombay, if you do it, you'll see Bombay has a three, a big fat three on it. That means instead of rolling one loot die, you roll three loot die. And you add up all those numbers... And you divide, so nine. So this one guy would get nine dollars if they wanted to do that. Um, uh, Hayes asks a great question. Do untapped officers get a share of the loot and or skulls? No. They do not. That is a big difference from the first edition of the game. Only the officers that were tapped get a share of the loot. Um, if there were multiple skulls rolled... I don't know where that skull went. There it is. I guess it's on six. How nice. If there are multiple skulls rolled, you would roll this die three times. <laughs> because you, you have to make a death check for each skull rolled. If you are successful, the flag of this region comes to live in the president box. The dome is set aside. And any strength the region had is gone. And now, this empty spot represents an office that will exist. And what you do... Uh-oh, did I... One second. I did the thing. There we go. Uh, what you do then is you get the proper... So here's the governor of Bombay, which is paired to Bombay. You make that a vacant office, and when somebody fills it, their guy will sit right there to be show that they're the governor. Now, um... When you loot a region, the very last thing I'll say about looting a region is, um, let's say there were uh, two officers and I rolled, I don't know, three. So this is, this person gets a dollar, this person gets a dollar, uh, and then there's one dollar that can't get divided between these two officers. That dollar just goes to sit on the region. Now every region has a treasury if it has a if it's an office and in the previous game the the treasuries were uh, like separate cards or it well, weren't separate yeah they were cards but you like put them on the region itself in this you do too and you 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 can copy a little uh, number counter and so that remainder dollar goes here and then this governor of Bombay will get to can spend from this treasury so it's not not that big treasury just a little treasury. Um, okay, cool. So that's th those are all the military actions. Now, one thing that I need to underline like a million times is uh, this is dumb. This is a bad situation to be in because what this means is that you have no defensive army left. So I want to make it abundantly clear that like if you spend all of your armies going on these military adventures, you don't have any defenders to come. So if you get invaded, you're you're just out of luck. Um, okay, so now we go on to the uh, trade action. Oh, uh, I'll say um, provincial offices get to act during this military part. And they can go uh, invade and invest and do all kinds of things. Um, but one, one thing I'll mention about them is uh, the president decides force priority. So if, you know, if the governor of Bombay wants to invade the Punjab, but the president of Bombay wants to clear this chaos, 
and they both want to use the same officers, the president gets priority. And if the president is managing multiple governorships, let's say, you know, all of these regions are controlled by the company, uh, the president decides force use priority. Um, okay, so uh, that's that. Now let's talk about trade. So the way trade works in the game is uh, every region has a bandwidth. The bandwidth is the lower of the, the, the lowest number between number of ships in the region and number of riders in the region. So, uh, but the Bombay presidency, which is like this zone, I'll just kind of direct it, it has a bandwidth of one because it has one ship. Uh, the trade uh, procedure is as follows. Every dollar you spend is a die you roll. So we'll have the, the president spend three dice. And um, you have to declare what you want to trade to. And every region outside of your home region costs uh, a, a red die. It eliminates a die. So in this instance, if I were trading to just Bombay, I don't have to pay a penalty. But if like this were free and I wanted to get up here into Delhi, I would have to pay a penalty of one to get up there. But in this instance, I only have a bandwidth of one, so like I'm just going to roll my three dice, and we'll see what happens. And I and n nothing happened. So my lowest die was a three or a four. If I had money left, I could attempt another um, trade. Critically, there is no instant debt anymore. I can't like wire London and be like, I need more money. No, the, the, the chairman either sent me money at the start of the turn or didn't. Um, so for sake of example, though, let's say I was successful. Um... If I was successful, I take one of these riders, it can be any of the riders, and I put them on the map on top of the order. And then this order was a $4 order, so I increase this to 4 Now, if my lowest number had been a 5 or 6, I would be eliminated instantly and go back to my stock, whatever player stock that would be. Okay, uh, presidents want to fill orders because they are going to get a special bonus of one buck for every order they filled. Um, I'll talk about special bonuses a little bit later, but usually presidents want to want to fill orders. Um, okay, cool. So that's how presidents work, which means you know how the Madras presidency works. You know how the Bengal presidency works. Um, one little thing, uh, riders carry the association of their presidency. So let me show you an example. This is kind of a strange point. It like almost never comes up, but it does sometimes. So let's say like the Bombay presidency did this. And then we get to the Bengal presidency, which its home port is here, Calcutta. We'll sail out of Calcutta. And the Bengal presidency goes like, doot, doot, doot. Now at this point, they're, they have riders touching another presidency's riders, and so in order for players to keep the association of riders straight, you just drop one of these little roads on there to show that, like, this is one presidency's riders, and this is another presidency's riders. And then these, these just go back when you do cleanup, just so you know where to put the riders after they're done. The game will probably come with, like, four of these, because they're almost never used. But in the late game, sometimes they come up. Um, okay, so I'm going to keep a couple pieces out so folks can see how things work later. Um, when you're filling orders, they can't have chaos. You always have to start with the home port and then or any port that they've already traded with. So you can like do these lines. You can branch your line, all that kind of stuff. Very permissive track lane rules, John Company. Uh, all right, so now let's go to the last part of the turn. We're making pretty good time. Let's see, we're about half an hour into the teach, about an hour into the video. Um, usually this game takes me like 40 minutes to explain. Uh, I've done it two ways. I think there's a, there's a short teach you could do um, that you could probably get people playing in about 20 minutes. And then the teach I'm giving you now, which is like very long and uh, has a lot of digressions, that takes like an hour, hour and a half to get through everything. Um, the game will probably come with a single turn walkthrough to teach players. I'm not sure. Those take a long time to make, and I don't know. Um, not not positive yet, but, but this game lends itself to a walkthrough. Uh, okay, so next phase, adjust factory profits. Uh, so let's say the company traded all this stuff, traded to here, let's say. Um, mm, we'll trade to here. Just, uh, oh. Resistance is much better than chaos. 
thank you for that suggestion. I just hadn't like given it a little thought yet. I mean, like turmoil. I don't know. We'll have to. I'll. 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 I'll I'm going to think about this a little bit. But resistance is good. The only problem with resistance is it's a long word, uh, with a lot of syllables. But I'll, I'm going to think about it. that. That's a very good suggestion. Thank you. Uh, that's to, to the tat. Uh, to the chat. Okay, so let's do factory profits. So the way factory profits works is we're, we are combining two numbers. The first number is right here. So that we, we note that the income is on 20. Let's say we made $20 last turn. And so we are on the minus one band. And we combine that minus one with whatever the top discard is of the evening post, the plus one, which is zero. So the factory profits does not move. If we had been here, factory profits would move up twice. I probably need, I'm going to need to adjust these tracks at some point. I just haven't gotten around to it. Um, if the f company does really well, factory profits start to bomb. And this is because um, the British Wollens could not compete with Indian textiles. Um, okay. Yeah, I, I uh, just more on the chaos versus resistance. It's like both. So one of the tricky things is that from the company's perspective, a region that was disordered kind of looked and behaved the same way as a region that was ordered but resistant. And so I want to like capture that homogeneity, even though it like, I don't know. I, I'm, I'll get into it. I, could, I, I feel like I could talk all day about the, the, some of the weird ways about Indians representation, India's representation in the game. Um, okay, so that's Factory Profits. Okay, now we do bonuses. This is a new phase for people who have played the first edition, and you'll want to pay attention here. So bonuses work like this. Uh, every shipyard that has a fitted ship, right, so like that doesn't have a ship on top, makes a buck from the bank. Factories make money based on their current profitability. And then anybody who has a special bonus makes a special bonus. Uh, there are two major types of special bonuses. So one type of special bonus is presidential bonuses. You get $1 for every order you complete in this presidency. The other type of special bonus is a governor's special bonus. There's a governorship, which makes a, an amount of money, the wealth of the region minus the chaos here. You may place this money in your region or in your personal treasury. Just, just like the old one game for those. All right, then we do company revenue. So the way company revenue works is first the company has to pay expenses. They pay expenses for, and this is different, so like the old game, they pay expenses for each debt, each officer, and newly for each ship. So this is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight dollars in expenses. So we go two, three, boop. There we go, twelve dollars. So we pay expenses there. Then the chairman gets to choose to pay dividends. Every dividend paid it costs one dollar per share. So I could pay like one dividend, for instance, and go here. That's five dollars. And then blue would make two. White would make one, yellow would make one, green would make one. Um, they can pay more than one dividend if they'd like. Uh, let's say they're going to pay two dividends. So that takes them down to just $2 left, which means in total, blue made $4, and then each of the other single shareholders made a dollar, or made $2, rather. Then we look at the standing chart. And basically, there's a number of questions you have to ask. And if they have the arrow pointing back, standing moves down. If they have the arrow pointing up, standing moves up. So were two or more dividends paid? Yes, we move standing up. If no dividends were paid, we move standing down. If we started on a debt token, we move it back. Uh, and then uh, if there's no income after expenses, uh, we'll talk, I'll talk about that in a second, then we move down. So uh, the way that works is if there was more expenses than revenue, you have to take emergency loans. And those emergency loans each are worth five bucks, which you add to this little track. And be, if you had to take emergency loans, you will uh, fall one in this, in this standing. Um, I'm adjusting some of these uh, things right now, but they, they generally work. They almost work. It's, 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 it's a little tricky. Uh, okay, cool. So that's the revenue phase, and now we go to the evening posts and storms. So um, 
the evening post works like this. Shuffle this deck, flip a card. Uh, and then you resolve this evening post card. They Cards have two elements. They have a, uh, or they have three elements really, but they have uh, the number of events in India. They have a law or event, domestic, that's right here. And then they have a uh, factory profitability thing, which will happen during this phase, if it's on top of the discard. Um, so I will talk about the laws in a bit. Uh, I'm just going to like hold on to all this stuff right now. And then after you resolve this card, you will uh, roll this die for storms. Now, the way the storms work is, okay, so like here's the south. I rolled the south Indian Ocean for storms. What that means is every ship in the south Indian, you roll a die. On a one or two, the ship is fine. On a three or four, it generates a fatigue which you just put a black disc on the ship. And on a five or six, it, the ship's destroyed. When the ship is destroyed, it is returned to its uh, shipyard that's attached to it, where it can be refitted. If it has a fatigue on it, every fatigue on a ship will increase all future fatigue rolls by, rolls by one. So I have, you know, I have one fatigue on the ship. Next storm that hits it is a five, plus one is a six, so it sinks. If this had been a four, it would still sink. Um, okay, I hope that makes sense. So that's storms. All right, now, as I said, I'm going to talk about laws and voting and all that stuff in a minute. Ah, you know what? Maybe I should just talk about it now, just because I think it might be easier to follow for a teaching video. Okay, let's just do it now. Okay, so first, let, we're going to do events in India. All right, now, what this means is there are three events in India, and each one is the flipping of one of these cards. So let's do the first event. Okay. So um, the way this works is uh, these two decks often interact with each other, if that makes sense. These two decks often interact with each other. So um, peace as an event. So there's only like four or five different types of events, and I'm going to just talk you through all of them. The peace event says, uh, look at the, where the elephant is. And any orders that have a connection that crosses that border will lose their chaos. So that like cleared off the chaos here. If there had been a chaos here and here, both cha whoops, uh, both chaoses would be removed. But in this case, just the one chaos was removed. Then the elephant moves to where? To the Punja. So the elephant arrow moves to wherever that deck tells you to move it. So the elephant's going to the Punjab. Now you have to ask yourself a question. If the Punjab is currently dominated by someone, as they are by Delhi, you put the elephant on the border to show that the Punjab is getting ready to attack Delhi. If the Punjab were not dominated, you refer to the little symbol right here, this little moon. And so the little moon says, okay, where are we going to go? And you look for the little moon, and here's the little moon. And so, like, they would still attack Delhi. But if it were a triangle, they would, like, attack Bombay instead. But they're dominated, so they're going to get ready to attack Delhi. Okay, so that's the, the peace event. Let's do the next event. Turmoil. So the turmoil event, where does it occur? It occurs in the Punjab. And what you do is you add a chaos token to the northernmost order that does not have chaos. So for example, like in Madras, if, if there was chaos in Madras, turmoil in Madras, we would put a chaos token right here. Uh, you always go to the northernmost order that is not covered by chaos. If all orders are covered by chaos, the region has a collapse, or you know, or maybe not a collapse, something more, a more neutral turn. I'll, I'll use I'll use the way that the Brits would have, would have thought about this, and we can talk about the optics later, uh, and, and, and tuning our lens properly. But basically what that does is it places a chaos on every connected order without chaos. Pandemic style. Now, if there were already a chaos here, it doesn't continue to cascade. It just cascades next to the Punjab. So in this case, Punjab's in turmoil, and we drew turmoil per Punjab, so it goes cover cover like that. Okay, that's turmoil event. Let's go to the next one. A leader event. 
So this is leader in Delhi. Now leader is plus a castle, which you might guess means Delhi gets a castle, which is exactly true. Now, uh, you'll note that there is a number three underneath this. If Delhi were owned by the, Brit by, by the company, uh, company regions, like over here, Bombay, can't have domes. They cannot generate forts. So if we get a Bombay leader, it turns into a rebellion of the strength uh, written beneath the card. And in order to beat back a rebellion, you have to exhaust that many officers. Ah, yes, correct. Um, uh, th th that's a very good reminder. If you put a chaos on a place with a writer, like if there's turmoil in Maratha and we have to put the thing in the northernmost order, which is this one, um, this writer's dead. They get killed. Good for them. Okay, so turmoil in Bombay. So in, in this, and actually, here it is as, as an example. Uh, turmoil in Bombay, this will put a turmoil on the northernmost non-chaotic order. So it's that one, which will kill this rider instantly. They're dead. And then and they go back to their player. Okay, uh, that is almost all of the events. Um, I'm going to keep flipping through them. Okay, here, here's Crisis. This is a very important event. The Crisis event works like this. Um, the, you look at the position of the elephant and you assess the strength of the aggressor and the strength of the defender. Uh, and so the uh, aggressor has a strength of zero. The defender, Delhi, has a strength of two. So, and then you add the crisis value to the aggressor. So in this case, the aggressor has two, the defender has two. Defender wins ties. Uh, so Delhi is victorious, right? They've got, it's two to two. Delhi's victorious because they're defending. And then the loser has to lose a strength. Now, the way strength works, these forts are strength, right? Uh, the way strength works is if you don't have any strength to lose, um, you generate a chaos. So Punjab doesn't have any strength to lose, it generates a chaos. However, it's already caused chaos in its neighboring regions, so n nothing will happen here. It's already fully locked out. And then, after you resolve that crisis, the elephant marches. And where does it march? It's going to march to Madras. Now we ask ourselves, is Madras independent? Do they have their own flag? They do. In which case, it will target the moon, which is down here. And so that means that they're targeting uh, Mysore. So Madras is getting ready to battle Mysore. And then let's go to some more events. Okay, the shuffle event. The way this works is you shuffle this card with the bottom of the deck. Shuffle. And then you shuffle the top and put it on top. Also pandemic style. Uh, there you go. Now, you we've done pretty much all the events. There's one event that we have not talked about. Uh, there's actually two events we haven't talked about, which I'll talk about very quickly here. Um, so the first event is the windfall event. Um, all the riders here, so like riders in Punjab, and in any adjacent region will generate a dollar. So good, good for riders, the windfall event. And then the other event is the foreign invasion. So this is like an invasion of France, or it could be an invasion of Persia, or whatever. There, there are historically people who could have threatened any of these regions. Um, or it could be like a religious group, um, you know, in the center of India, you could imagine uh, that's the case. But uh, the way this works is you attack this region with a crisis of 1d6. If the region falls, place chaos on every order in the region. So it kind of like closes off a region. Um, and I, I'm going to maybe adjust this a little bit, but it, it works fine right here. Uh, you, you don't like, the region doesn't lose any strength or anything like that. Um, it will probably end up gaining strength once I have this fully realized. Okay, so, sorry, that's a big whirlwind. Uh, a lot easier than the old system, though. Um, but a little, well, it's actually, it's not necessarily easy, simpler than the old system, but it is easier to understand what's happening. Um, so then, uh, you know, you're only going to draw three of these cards each turn for the uh, events. And then we're going to vote on the law. So now it's time to talk about law voting. So the way law voting works is first the chairman, uh, this card is goofy, I'll fix it. Uh, the, the chairman uh, reads the law and its popular supports. So the chairman says trade regulations. The law before parliament is uh, presidents must pay twice the penalty when trading. 
So it's very, you know, it's still easy to trade in your home regions, but very expensive to go in deeper into India. And currently, uh, the popular support should be, it should say minus one, but it's plus zero, same, same thing. So the, the, currently, the law is failing. Now, at this point, the chairman opens the floor and says, would anybody like the floor to speak in favor or against the law? And any player can do this. And so, like, White could say, I'd like to speak for the law, right? So White can make their, their piece. If, if multiple people want to speak, the chairman decides between ties. And players can speak multiple times. Uh, so, so White could say, uh, I, I, you know, I support this law. I think it should pass. And can begin tapping shipyards. And for every shipyard or factory they tap, they can advance this track by one. Uh, with the consent of other players, they could say, Blue, I know you agree with me. And Blue says, of course I agree with you. And uh, Blue can tap their two votes to increase this. And each dollar you spend, let's say they had $3, they could spend $2, for instance, to advance this two more. Um, and, and then they could say, yep, chairman, that, that's it. I re rest, rest my case. And then the chairman will say, uh, all right, looks like trade regulations is currently passing. Would anybody else like the floor to speak? And then that, you know, and then Orange could say, well, I, you know, I'm uh, completely against trade regulations. I want to spend $8, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, to make sure it fails. And then the after, then they cede the remainder of their time, and they, the, the chairman says, all right, this law is currently failing. Does anybody else want to speak for it? As soon as everyone is done, I'm sorry, uh, as soon as no one else wishes to speak, the chairman announces that the law has either passed, in which case it is placed up here in this top row, or if it failed, it just remains on the uh, discard pile. Whoo, all right, that's the, that's the law phase. It can get very uh, animated. Uh, or, you know, sometimes it isn't animated. Sometimes you look at it and you're like, hey, trade regulations are failing. Anybody, everybody good with that? And people are like, yeah, of course, it's good. I want the trade regulations to fail. Um, and so sometimes the law of voting is very, very fast. Now, there are, there's another type of law called a domestic event. And when the domestic event happens, here's the timber shortage. Uh, you just do what it says. There's no voting. So set this card near the past laws. Bloop. For as long as this card remains in play, shipyards do not generate bonuses and ships cost an additional dollar for uh, in expenses for company and firms. During attrition, roll for this card too. So th th this card will eventually go away, but while it's here, it's going to hurt. Uh, can you speak twice? Someone asks in the comments. Yes, you can. Uh, but if you are tapping things to vote, things can only vote once. And then at the end of the vote, after the law has either passed or failed, all of these will flip back to their unvoted side. Yep. Uh, uh, but, but that, Gary, that, yeah, uh, uh, I did say that, but it is a very good point to underline that people can talk talk multiple times. So, for instance, like, you know, a fir you, sometimes there's a fir initial round of talking where the, the party for will, like, exhaust all their factories and, and shipyards, and the party against will exhaust theirs, and things will still be close, and then the leader of a party or someone will just say, like, okay, I'm going to start spending money. And remember, money and favors and all that stuff can freely move in any of these phases. So someone can say, like, please vote for this, I'll give you a few promises, things like that. Uh, this is a pretty active phase, often. Okay, we talked about storms, we talked about laws. We have just a few phases to talk about, and then we're, like, kind of done. And I'm happy to take any questions. So first, let's do attrition and family upkeep. Uh, this is very different from the original game and sort of uses the seniority variant for the first one. That It's a little different than that, but uh, from the first edition. Uh, let's say that we'll use the Walsh family as our example. Um, oh, there are no, uh, there are no take backs. Uh, if you cast a, a, a vote for something, it is cast for that thing. You cannot change that. No take backsies. Um, okay. So, I mean, obviously, if, you know, some of that is going to be preference of the group. I play with no take. Yeah. Um, yeah, You once you have voted, you can't resend those votes. Um, shouldn't have voted so hastily. Uh, okay. Yeah, so, and, and it's funny. There are no rules about take backs in the rules, but in the sense that, like, the they just don't exist in, in the game. Um, so it's, like, not something player. So everything uh, um, that a player can trade um, is talked about in detail in the trading section of the rules there are, uh, players cannot trade the rewinding of previous actions if that makes sense 
Uh, correct. Now, I could, for instance, on the initial vote, use my shipyards to vote for something, uh, you know, for army spending or something like that. And then later, someone says, it's coming down to the wire. If you could you spend some money the other way? Of course, that's completely fine. You can vote both ways. Heck, if I had a shipyard and a factory, I could have one shipyard vote one way and another shipyard vote the other way. That's fine. Um, especially if they're like, you know, threatening me with a blackmail card or there's, you know, stuff like that. Um, okay, so let's talk about attrition. Uh, well, you guys already know the rules for attrition because it works the same as the boats. So the way attrition works is you roll a die for every office. And on a one or two, nothing happens. On a three or four, the office generates a fatigue. And on a five or six, the office retires. And for every fatigue on an office, future rolls, uh, one is added to the roll. Uh, so that, that's attrition. You, you roll for attrition. Now, uh, I just lost the president of Bombay. And what that means, here, we'll do it like this so I can use the Walsh. Uh, I take my card and put it on the vacant offices box, and then this guy becomes a pensioner, this little bro with the nose. Um, okay, so now he, he's a pensioner. If I had any family expenses, I would also have to pay them right now. If I can't pay my expenses, I lose the prize. So if I had zero dollars and I had a dude up here, uh, she has an expense of four. If I can't pay that, I lose the... 10 victory points. So I'm going to be uh, going deep in debt, borrowing money from other players to pay those expenses, probably. Okay, so that is uh, the attrition phase. Now, attrition has supported me with a pensioner, which unlocks in the family phase the retire action, which allows me to pay to assign a pensioner. Okay, so uh, let's talk about stock buys now. So this was a, a phase that we skipped during the first turn. Uh, the way stock buys works is basically there are three steps, and I'm just going to go through them in very, like, I'm going to be very boring as I talk about stock buys. So the first step is, so the first thing you do is buy debt, then you check for share creation, and then you slide. So buying debt. For each debt, uh, re promote the topmost player to the court and remove the debt. Just like that. Easy. If, if there's multiple debt, you'll do it multiple times. All right. Uh, so that that's step one. Step two. If there is a guy, a person, a family member, a child, in the top place of the stock exchange track, they will be promoted to the court. Now, this only happens if there was no debt sold. So if somebody was on the five and there was no debt, this guy would get promoted. If there was debt, the debt would be removed and he'd be promoted. But then we would skip this check share creation stage. Okay, so this is share creation. Boop. Then lastly, everybody who's currently on the, the track will slide up to the top position of the track. So going through that again uh, without pieces so people don't get confused. Um, first, for each debt, you buy the topmost share. Then, if there happens to be a person here, a share is created. Then, all pieces slide up. Let's see, a question from Garrick. If a person gets kicked out of the prize retirement area, do they return to your pool or your pension box? Your pool, they're gone. They're back to, they're, they're back to square one. They're, you know, they, they start life as a little baby. Um, they're, they're over here. Um, oh, one thing I should say, too. In your family phase, any children or pensioners that are remaining are cleared. So if you don't find a place for this pensioner to retire, they're, they're, in the, they're over here. They're in the, the poorhouse. They're a pensioner in care of the church. Um, and then uh, Hepo, uh, or Mar, excellent question. Uh, yes, basically the way this works is if there's someone on the five spot, they'll always become a share. It will either remove the debt or it won't if there's no debt. That's probably a better way to explain it. Um, you've got it. Okay, so that's stock buys. Now let's talk about hiring. So the way hiring works in the game 
is you will organize these cards. And uh, eventually when we have a nice mod, I'll make a script that organizes these cards or I'll have someone do it for me. Um, and, uh, or, you know, you, if you put them in a stack and right click and go to search, you can order them pretty easily there. Or you could just put the vacant offices in this area and just order them manually, whatever. Um, the way it works is you start with the lowest number and go to the highest number and you just fill them one at a time. So the president of Bombay, the way this works is they are chosen by the director of trade. So the director of trade is the operative uh, hirer and their candidate pool is anyone in the presidency, writers, officers, or provincial offices. So if we're hiring the president of Bombay, Blue gets to do the hiring, they're the director of trade, and they can choose between uh, Yellow, who has an officer, Blue, who has a governor, Orange, potentially, or actually let's say there is no governor here yet, uh, Orange or Blue. So it's Orange, Blue, or Yellow could be picked. Now, if Blue picks themselves, they have to give each player they passed up a promise cube. So they'll have to give Yellow one promise, piece, one promise uh, token from their stock, and have to give orange. So they would go like this. One to yellow, and one to orange, and then they could say, because I'm promoting myself. That's called the nepotism rule. Um, oh, my stream just collapsed. Hold, please. Okay, sorry, my stream's back now. Uh, all right, so hopefully you guys got that. If you promote yourself, every player you passed up gets a promise piece. That is the nepotism rule. Um, if, this is important, let's say there was a governor. Let's say blue, what, what was a governor? So this is uh, about as complicated as this can get. If, uh, if blue was a governor... Yeah, we'll, we'll make we'll make another player a governor. I don't want to make it too weird. Um, let's say White is the governor of Bombay, which means uh, when it comes to the filling of the president of Bombay, the candidate pool is uh, this writer in Bombay, orange, these officers, the, an officer in Bombay, yellow, or White, the governor of Bombay. Basically, anybody associated with this presidency. Now, let's say Blue decides to pick White for the job. Whenever an office holder gets immediately promoted uh, to the new card, they immediately get to fill their previous job. The holder of the job gets to fill the previous job from the candidate pool. So in this case, it would have to be yellow. So this piece, uh, this officer would get promoted up there, and then this would go to, to yellow. Um, so that, that's, the, that's the rule of succession, which now I'm thinking about it might be kind of goofily oriented in the rule book. I'll check that after the stream. I'll make note of it. Check succession. Because it's, it's changed a couple times, but that's, that's the rule of succession. Okay, so that's the heart of hiring. Um, most of the hiring in the game is very simple, like this person can select from these people. The only exception to that is the chairman. Now, oh, uh, I should say one other thing. The director of trade. Where is the director of trade? Um, so the director of trade, the candidate pool is basically people on this line, like other offices, which means there's always going to be succession. One second, let me block this person. How do I do this? Dismiss. All right. Sorry about that. <laughs> yeah, well, um, maybe maybe they're just an, it's an elaborate troll. Uh, who knows? OK, so uh, the director of trade is going to you know, pick from those offices. You'll note on the director of trade, they have a prestige card. This means that the moment that they are hired, they get to draw a prestige card. So whoever gets picked to be direct director of trade, they get a, they get to take a prestige card. Good for them. Um, okay, so then we get to the chairman. Now you'll notice the chairman has a lot more text on it than the other offices. Oh, uh, if an office is promoted, any fatigue? Oh, no, my stream. Ah, stream collapse. 
Sorry about that. It looks like things are just going to be blurry for a second. Um, so uh, one other quick note. If, if, uh, if an office is growing up, if military affairs is hired as the director of trade, uh, any fatigue on military affairs will go to the director of trade. So the, the fatigue will carry um, w w with the person as they age up. Okay, let's talk about the chairman. This is one of my favorite parts of the game, actually. I love uh, how this election works. So, the way the chairman election works is the former chairman runs the election, and if there if a tie ever comes up, the chairman will a will, will re resolve the tie. Uh, first step is you stack all the shares. So we stack the shares like this, and then starting with the player with the fewest shares former chairman deciding ties, uh, a player is, is given a choice to either stand or support. So basically, uh, the short version of this is it's ranked choice voting. Um, and this is to represent the many ballots that, uh, that the court w would go through to figure out who should be the next uh, chairman. So the way this works is, um, you know, the, the, one, of the, one of the players with the fewest shares in the court is selected, and they have to stand or support. If they stand, they, they put their guy down here in the vacant offices box. All right. Uh, if they support, so let's say Yellow says, okay, I say, all right, for, I'm former chairman. Yellow, you're first. And Yellow says, I'm going to stand to be chairman. And then I'm saying, okay, White, what about you? What do you want to do? And White says, I really don't want Yellow, but I don't want to stand for it myself. I'm going to choose to support and yellow could say, or white could say, I'm going to support green. And when they do that, they put their piece underneath the other piece. And the goal is that you want to be a stack that is standing that is more than half. So uh, we've got five shares, so three is the magic number. So a person here needs three shares. So now we have two stacks, and the former chairman could say, hey, blue, you're the lowest stack in the court of directors. What are you going to do? Are you going to stand or are you going to support? And Blue could say, I'm going to stand. And then I, I go to the lowest stack in the core directors and I say, Green, what are you going to do? And Green says, hmm, uh, you know what? I'm going to stand after all. Green's going to stand. Now, if this, if Green would have supported Yellow, Yellow would win the election because Yellow has three shares. But instead, Green chooses to stand. Uh, so now we have three people standing, and no one has gotten a majority. So we do the same thing, but we move it to the to the people standing. And I say, okay, second ballot time. Yellow, you've got the you're you're standing for candidacy, and you have the lowest support. You need to choose one of these two to support. And so yellow says, after some bribes, well, blue, it'll be you. Blue now has a pure majority, and so. Uh, they have secured the chairmanship. They uh, put their piece here. Because they won the chairmanship, they get a prestige card, just drawn off the top of the deck. And then all of the other shares uh, go back to the court. Now, uh, one weird situation that can happen is, let's say the court looks like this, and yellow decides to stand for uh, to support blue, and green decides to support blue, and white decides to support blue. In this instance, if it's Blue's turn to pick and there is no one and they have all the support beneath them, they can pick anybody to become chairman. Anybody in their stack. Um, anyway, that, that's how that works. There, there, there's a couple little uh, weird rubs that I'm working out, but m most of the system seems to be working pretty well. Uh, okay, that is the, the chairman election. Um, there's an open question about, and actually what it will probably end up being, and this is like not exactly in the rules, but it'll be there. Um, can a person with two shares split their support? No. You you vote as a block. Uh, and then and what once you have put, so unlike voting or anything like that, once you've put your support behind someone, you no longer have the ability to do anything to like you, you like, can't change your mind later um, one rule that will probably exist but is not in the rule book right now is like if yellow stood and won with this support and yellow doesn't want to be chairman they can draft someone else into being chairman um, 
you usually want to be chairman in this game, but there are reasons. There are some situations where you might not want it. Um, and that way, that rule will, will probably have to exist. I'm going to write that down. Um, uh, chairman election. There we go. Cool. Um, like, basically the way it will work is if, like, let's say everybody chose to support yellow. Yeah, this is a lot cleaner if I just do it this way. Yellow can stand for election, win, and then can select any share in their stack to be the new chairman because they had all the power. They can direct it in whichever way they want. Um, shares, uh, in addition to generating money, shares are worth a victory point at the end of the game. But if the company failed, they're all worth minus a victory point. Um, okay. So that is the hiring phase. And I start to zoom out thinking if there's anything I forgot to talk about. Ah, the end game. So, John Company either ends immediately if either of the failure conditions is reached here or if a debt is ever placed there. You fill debt from left to right and then if, a, if the track's full and you have to add a debt, the company fails. If it fails, game's over immediately and you go to end game scoring. Um, Otherwise, you go to the end of the fifth turn. I will say that sometimes when you flip the event card on the fifth turn, if there's nothing relevant to the end of the game, you don't have to resolve it. I'm not po it, the game may end up ending after like revenue. I'm not. I'm not sure this is going to happen um, because it just seems like I don't know. It's, it's nonsense. Um, so let's talk about the end game. First thing you do is you score your shares. Then you check prestige. Everybody reveals all their prestige cards, those that are face up and those that are in their hand. Um, and adds up their prestige value. The person with the most prestige value takes back all of their promises. So if it's blue, blue would like take back all their promises. Then uh, you have to buy promises. Every promise that you have that's outstanding, you have to give that player $2. If you cannot do that, uh, you will take a promise penalty of two victory points lost per outstanding promise. Finally, you convert your cash. This is new. Um, based on the number of deeds you have, that's this middle column, you will convert your cash using this ratio. So if you have 10 or more deeds, you convert your cash at a one to one. If you only have three deeds, if you have three or more, you convert it at a four to one. If you have less than three, you can't convert your cash. Uh, this ship value right here is only used in the private firm game. Don't worry about it. It's not ready for testing yet. It's close, it's not ready quite yet. Uh, anyway, that's the end game scoring. Um, most points wins, <laughs> obviously. Um, let's see, is there anything I forgot to explain? I don't think so. Um, the private firm game is, all the rules are in the rule book for the private firm game. It just hasn't, it's only been through a couple. Um, oh, what happens in case of ties for prestige? No one gets it. You got to have more. You got to have the most. There can't be two Donald Trumps in this world. Or you got to pretend that you got the most. Um, so, oh, uh, is there a tiebreaker in the game? There is. I think it's the prestige value is the tiebreaker. I can't remember. I can't remember what the tiebreaker is. It's in the rules. There is a tiebreaker. Um, and then I don't know if there's a further tiebreaker. Maybe you make Beef Wellington. Uh, we'll have a cooking contest in all, in all the games. Probably not Beef Wellington. That's a hassle. Um... Okay, so uh, the private firm game, uh, there are rules that exist. Adventurous players are free to go explore it. Um, it has just started to enter internal development. So like we've, I've been designing a lot of this with an eye towards the private company, but the private company game, we've, I've played it three times. And so like two of those plays were like abortively bad <laughs> too. Or they, they, weren't, they weren't bad, they just, all the numbers are messed up. Um, and so I have to figure that figure that out. Uh, what happens in the, the case of ties? For, oh, I already answered that. Um, uh, 
So I, I am working on the, the private company game right now. Hopefully it'll be ready for a test in a week or two. Uh, it'll be good. And then, of course, the uh, the 1858, the 1758 scenario will be up, too. Um, all right. So I will hang out for a minute or two. If there are any questions for the chat, please uh, give them to me, and I will do my best to answer them while I take a much-needed drink. Ah, the, uh, the significance of the numbers below each region in uh, India. Yes. Uh, this number is the region's wealth value. It's how many loot dice you roll when you take it over. And when a uh, region is being taxed, like if this governor of Bombay were taxing Bombay, uh, they make three minus the chaos in the region in tax. So they would make a dollar in income. That is the, the uh, thing of that. Um, I didn't talk about the superintendent of chi trade in China. Uh, the way they work is they take their turn after the Bengal presidency before doing factory profits. And uh, their ships, they, they can have their own ships. Uh, they count as the East Eastern Indian. Um, and that's because a lot of the opium and stuff was actually done, made over here. Um, and then uh, the way they roll is uh, they have kind of a funny way of making money. So um, every dollar they spend is a die. Their penalty is the number of ships, but then they get money per ship. So there's a high startup, and then they become really lucrative. These numbers are likely going to shift around a bit, too. Um, okay. Well, I hope that gives you everything you need to play. I'm playing a lot of John Company this week. I'm actually, I'm going to be working on the rules probably this morning, doing some other um, back-end stuff. Uh... Ooh, what a good question for Vendetta. I'll, I'll answer that in just a second. Um, so, uh, do, 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 one second. Um, uh, so, um, yeah, so hopefully this gives you everything you need to know to start playing. Uh, the rules are close to complete, so you should be able to muddle your way through. I am quite available this week, so I'm happy to answer any questions people might have as they come into their games. I might be streaming a game or two um, over the course of the week, maybe streaming some stuff with, with the uh, later scenarios and some of the more experienced testers. Um, if I, uh, I did in the Discord... Um, I did in the Discord add a channel for looking for games, so people who want to find a game can just find one, and uh, I encourage you guys to play with each other, and I'll try to be on hand. Um, our Discord server is upgraded, so like the, our streaming is a little bit better, so you guys can stream on the server, and I can even hop in and just kind of help. Um, yeah, and that's it. I mean, a lot more details are in the, the Discord. I will be doing um, another stream with uh, the late company, like the post monopoly stuff, uh, probably in a few days. Once we, once I played it a few more times, maybe next week. I'm not sure, uh, but yeah, I'm happy to take any questions you have. Uh, and then, once the rules are through an editorial pass, I will give you guys access to, or I'll get, give you all access to the uh, Google Doc where we can drop comments and make suggestions there. And then, while that's going on, I will be getting things ready to kick them into layout, so you guys can actually look at how the rulebook might look and have spreads and things like that. But yeah, I hope uh, I hope this was a good introduction. Uh, lastly, someone asked me about the uh, what? Why is the Whirligig logo two colors? And it's because there is like a hint in our Kickstarter video for Premiere. It's my clue. But it's a Whirligig. It's a little. It's a little seed pod. Um, it doesn't. It kind of like when, once you see it. Once you see it, you'll see it. It's a seed pod that like comes off of like a maple tree or something. Um, they have a real name, those little whirling sea pods. And if Drew were here, he'd wrap me on the wrist and remind me of that name. But that's what it is. Um, okay, well, thank you all. Uh, this was a lot of fun. I will be putting this up on YouTube uh, shortly, and I'll be around on Discord for like the next hour. And then I've got to make the kiddos some lunch. So take care. Have a lovely winter break. Uh, if there's snow by you, go enjoy it. And if there's not any by you, enjoy the fact that there's none by you. All right, take care, everyone. Good afternoon.